welcome to Kamogi Report podcast brought to you by Tipperary Kamogi TV. I'm Jordan Canan and I'm delighted today to be joined by Clonty and Tipperary star uh, Sarah Friday and a literary therapist to the Tipperary senior Kamogi team, Kelly Byrne. Ladies, you're both very welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Jer. Thanks, Jer. Today's, today's podcast is focusing solely on the whole area of the anterior crucial ligament, the ACL. Um, it's an in area I'm very interested in myself and really looking forward to learning all more about it. Um, both my guests have lots of experience and knowledge in the area. Unfortunately for Sarah, she suffered two crucial ligament injuries. Um, the first one back in 2016 and again last year in 2020. And uh, Kelly, with her work as a literary therapist with the O'Brien Clinic in Tumivara and her own clinic in Holy Cross, has lots of experience specialising in sports injuries and musculoskeletal injuries. So um, we'll start off with you, Kelly. Um, maybe just explain to people what exactly is a ligament and what is your ACL and where would you find it? Grand. So a ligament, it's um, kind of a real fibrous connective tissue. So it attaches bone to bone. And what it usually does is it just holds to, to serve that joint in place just very passively. And it helps to keep that joint stable. So you'd often hear ligaments in the knee, the ankle, uh, places like that. Um, so they consist of tightly packed collagen and it just helps to resist any tensile load um, that goes through the joint. But obviously when there's enough tensile load force that's applied into that joint in a direction that it's obviously not meant to go, or maybe that there's not um, enough neuromuscular um, components to it, or that there's not enough muscular strength as well at the joint, um, that if that's insufficient, that that's where people then will pick up their injuries. So that's where you're getting the likes of your um, ligament sprains in your ankle or an ACL tear in the knee. Um, so the ACL, it's a ligament in the knee that crosses over from one side to another. So I think there's a picture that you have your possibly coming up later. Yeah. Um, it, it joins between the two big bones in the leg. So you have the femur, which is the really long bone that runs through the thigh. And then you have the tibia, which is your main shin bone at the bottom of the leg. And the ACL crosses over from one side to another. But at the back of the ACL is also so the PCL, so you have your ACL, which is your anterior crucial ligament, and the PCL, which is your posterior crucial ligament, and they cross over beside each other in an X form, and they both stop the, the knee moving in, in certain directions that it's not meant to go. So the ACL stops the tibia, which is your shin bone, moving forward underneath your femur, and the PCL stops your femur moving forward on top of the the tibia um and obviously when when one of them go then that's when you're you're running into trouble and that's where you get that big joint motion then coming in from the the shin bone that's able to to move or uh, the acl it's also at the point of rotation as well which is we'll get back to that later as to how the acl actually tears to begin with because it is on that axis of rotation and right in the middle of the knee um, and that's what makes the ACL so important because it's your main point of rotation and it's your main stability muscle right on the inside of the, the knee as well. Okay, so when we hear people saying, oh, they did their cruciate or Sarah's done her cruciate twice. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about tearing it then, is it? or Generally it is. So with any ligament, you'll have three grades of a tear. And this is where you see in an, an ankle sprain as well, let's say, you'll, you'll generally pick up a, a grade one tear, which is a, a, an easy kind of a sprain to pick up. You'd only maybe be out of the sport for two to three to four weeks. Um, grade one, it's, it's sort of touch, but there's no big damage to the ligaments. Then you have a grade two tear, which has, which is also possible to happen in, a, in an ACL, as well that you could pick up a, a grade one or grade two sprain um but when you hear somebody doing their cruciate generally it means a grade three tear which is that there's a total tear in the ligament um and that's where you're getting that full movement there's no end point at all in testing 
Whereas in grade one, there's a little bit of damage, but there's a very definite endpoint. You know, when you're doing your tests, there's there's no big movement in around the knee. Um, grade two, there's a little bit more movement, but there's still an end feel. You're still able to, to um, the, the leg doesn't totally move basically at the knee. And then grade three is there's no end point at all. The, the, the leg will, or the knee will move fairly freely with a, a grade three tear. So, when you hear people talking about a grade three, that's what they are generally talking about when you're, when you're talking about somebody doing their ligament. Um, the grade three is the one that you'll see as well with people getting surgically repaired more often than not. A grade one or a grade two would be very easy to just brace and then rehab the knee as well. And there, there wouldn't be any surgery required for a grade one or two and the ligament will just heal itself. And then obviously depending on whether it's a grade one or a grade two, um, it's dependent on the time that it takes. Um, but it's the grade three is the, the one that you see takes the nine months to the guts of a year to totally rehab from. Okay, so Sarah, um, you first um, damaged your cruciate in 2016. Can you take us back to then? Uh, was it a match or training or what happened to you? Yeah, uh, we were playing Kilkenny actually in uh, Centre Stadium. So definitely couldn't fall to pitch for any injuries. So we oh, we were getting absolutely trounced. I'll never forget it. Everybody was in bad form. I think we were losing by about 12 points um, at the time that I actually went down. And I was literally just trying to sidestep somebody. That was all it was. Um, in the middle of the field, tried to sidestep a girl, went down. The way I describe that one is it was just like twisting my ankle. Like if the, there was an initial in, but then kind of, I got up. And, and I didn't realize at the time what the physio was doing those tests that uh, Kelly was speaking about. I didn't know what that was um, at the time. And she said, are you sure you're okay to play on? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. So I got up and I wasn't, I always say I was only on the pitch for about five more minutes and management took me off. So that was definitely um, a, a weird one uh, in comparison to the, my second knee because I actually got up and, and I played on for a small bit. It was only when I went home that evening, um, nobody was coming up to you saying how you were or anything because we were after getting such a beating that nobody was talking to anybody nearly. And we had to go out and play Dublin the next weekend. So I actually drove myself home, uh, put the feet up. I think there was hurling on um, in the evening and was watching it away. And I say I must have been sitting down for about two or three hours straight. And obviously my knee was sore. I was icing it as if I was after twisting my ankle. And I remember I got up after sitting down for about three hours and I was like, something's not right here. Um, I went to turn and I fell down because I couldn't, um, I, 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 my knee went from under me. So then instantly kind of dad was a bit worried and we didn't really, to be honest with you, ACL wasn't on the mind. It was just that it was after twisting the knee. Um, went to training on the Tuesday, but obviously I was stiff at this stage. I had a bad limp on me. I wasn't training, but... In the back of my mind, I was kind of sure, look, I might play on Sunday against Dublin. Um, but then it wasn't long then. They were like, look, get the MRI. I was very adamant that I was fine. There was nothing wrong. Didn't want to get the MRI, but they said, go on, look, if it comes back clear, it's the best money we ever spent. So got the MRI and it actually came back. Um, I'll never forget Emily Hayden actually at the time rang me and the MRI came back that there was an incomplete tear on my ACL. So that's kind of like what Kelly was saying there, that it wasn't a complete tear there it wasn't a grade three so basically they were like look you don't know um how serious it is until you go up to see the surgeon so booked an appointment for sanctuary went up there and he was fairly optimistic when he made, made the report and when he felt um my knee because i was actually back running at that stage and uh, it was about four weeks later maybe about five weeks later i was back running a straight line and he had really good movement in my knee. He was like, look, I'm just going to give a quick look at the MRI, but I'm fairly confident it's only a grade one or a grade two. And he came back with, he was like, I'm not wrong that often. It was really more up in century. But he goes, if I can describe it to you like a string that's brittle, that's breaking off, your ACL is holding on by a, a thread. And um, he said, even though it's, it's still intact technically, uh, the likelihood is if you gave six months rehab and that you go out again and it will go. So his professional advice was that <clears throat> to go and get the operation because it basically was a grade three just off it. Like, so that's how my first one happened. Um, and it was a bit of 
like very unknown territory at that stage. Okay, that's interesting. And then last year, then um, I'll never forget your tweet at the start of the year. Um, you know, you had you were in with the Tip Lays footballers and the Camogie again, and you said how your summer plans of Camogie and football, you know, were were gone basically. That you were after doing your cruise shit again, and God, it was devastated for you. So that was a challenge match, I think, was it? Yeah, it was Camogie. Um, again, we were playing Cork in St. Patrick's College in Hurlis. Um, it was January 10th or whatever it was, start of the year, but like we were, there was a lot of work done before that. Like I definitely was in probably the best condition that I'd been in in a long time between training with the football and the Camogie. But I definitely, I'd stand by it that I wasn't overtraining. Like I was looking after myself. Um because a lot of the people, a lot of, even myself afterwards, I questioned myself a lot, had to, was I doing too much? But I'm fairly confident, like I had a lot of people monitoring it, like I wasn't overtraining, but we played Cork anyway, and it was actually going quite well in the match, and I can remember just coming out of the half-back line, probably too far back up the field anyway, but um, coming out, out, back, out of the half-back line with a ball, and whatever happened, it was just like a girl came in behind me to tackle me, and I, I genuinely I don't know like it's just, I, only for I look back on the match in the center stadium that's the only reason why I knew what happened like I, I kind of get lost in these things um a girl was tackling me and she kind of fell on top of me whether my foot lodged in the dirt and the muck of St. Pat's at the same time as she kind of fell on top of me um and that happened or else it was direct contact I'm actually not too sure but this was a different experience altogether than the first time um it was absolutely excruciating like I'd say Kelly was there on the day and I'd say a lot of people said my roars could be nearly heard around the town <laughs> it was a different um different kettle of fish than the first time I knew straight away that uh, something was wrong and I was down I'd say for a good few minutes and everybody was kind of aware um when you see anybody that has previous knee injuries going down you instantly kind of get a shock and I remember even um, my teammate and club mates, I caught the van and I just remember seeing her face and just thinking, oh, Jesus, if she looks like that, <laughs> something's seriously wrong. Like, um, So anyway, I got myself off that day, but I was fairly adamant, even though everybody's telling me to relax and, you know, you don't know until you get MRI, until everything. I was fairly convinced of myself that I had uh, done the ACL again um, that day. So, yeah, a lot of emotion physically under in a lot of pain but emotionally mentally was very distraught um for what I had planned to be a great summer as you were saying yeah and but it's a totally different scenario from the first time pain wise yeah so I did um I did a lot more damage this time around first of all I tore my ACL uh fully so that was a like Kelly was saying there at the start that was a full grade and um, tree full rupture so that was definitely one of the pain, but also, which Kelly might come in on it there as well, a lot of people say I did my MCL, so my medial ligament um, as well this time around, which I didn't do the first time. And a lot of people, I think Ashley Maloney um, last year also did her medial ligament. Quicker recovery, but the pain is meant to be nearly worse than when you actually do your cruciate. So that was um, an interesting one. Uh, definitely because whether I'm, I'm not sure if it's because I did my cruciate fully this time or was it because I did my medial and I actually did a quite a bad medial tear as well um a grade two with that so if it was any further with that um I might have had to get surgery on that as well so I was in a brace for a few weeks after that as well I had completely lost um control in my knee it was going from under me so yeah totally different experience and I think Kelly would that be right in saying that that it was the medial that probably was causing the pain there or yeah yeah because what you'll often see with um a grade three rupture of an ACL is you have that instant blind and pain and then it can dissipate then afterwards because it's a complete rupture you could end up um disrupting the nervous um the nervous system then and you don't have the same pain uh, going through a grade three because you have that complete tear. Nerves are gone. Have a grade yeah. two tear, you still have some of those pain receptors going through. So it's actually worse pain wise sometimes to get a grade two. Initially, a grade three is excruciating, but the pain can go down then quickly afterwards as opposed to a grade two, which is fairly consistently sore because you still have that small little attachment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
the fact that you had the yeah. MCL grade two tear definitely would have added to that situation. So it's interesting hearing the two different injuries. And there was two, your left and your right knee, wasn't it, Sarah? Two, yeah, two legs. To totally symmetrical now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting hearing um, how the first one was caused and how the second one was caused. And Kelly, what would be the most common um, cause of ACL? Do you know, there's can it be contact and then there can be no contact. Would that be right? Yeah. So exactly how Sarah is after describing her mechanism of injury there. Um, the most common way is if there's a twisting movements, a sudden change of direction, if there is deceleration or if there's any kind of pivoting at the knee. So in sport, the most common mechanism of injury is if you're coming down on the leg from a height or if you are trying to do some kind of cutting maneuver. So sports where there's a big demand, obviously, for that type of um, skills would be camogie, football, basketball. So that's where you're seeing an awful lot of these ACL injuries coming in. Um, and then a big question that often would people ask is why did it happen now when I've been a camogie player for 30 years of my life? Why have I now just picked up an ACL injury? And a lot of that will be external factors. So in Sarah's case with the second ACL injury, when there was a, a, a girl came up behind her, that was an external factor that she wouldn't have factored in to this under normal circumstances. So if there's um, the athlete is being put off balance or if they're being pushed by um, another person on another team. Um, and that's why it's important then in your rehab to include real sports specific uh, rehab for um, helping to deal with those outside situations, basically that you can react quickly to them, that you're gonna help prevent those kind of injuries going forward then. Okay. And then you hear people talk about, you know, the pitch or, Football boots, I think, you know, I remember one time when the blades were getting a lot of bad um, rep that they were causing this. Can they have, uh, they have factors as well, like the pitch and conditions, the weather? Yeah, no, they definitely can. Those longer studs can definitely have an effect on an ACL. But again, exactly how um, Sarah described her, her injury, that her foot was... Um, impact it was in the ground was a bit stuck in the ground and then she went to go and turn and then that's when the ACL went so the longer studs will obviously stick in the ground a little bit more and that's when your foot is going to be in that turned out position and um, but then the knee stays traveling so if you're stuck in the mud and then you go to try and turn quickly or you go to do some sort of big cutting maneuver your deceleration or um, having to, to change direction very quickly then that's when you run into difficulty then okay because i actually uh, listened to a podcast only today um i was doing the last minute of prepping for our podcast and um i came across the podcast by ray moore and he he carried probably did both your surgeries there did he in this yeah central good city? friend yeah. <laughs> yeah you know well and actually he was giving a talk all about acls and he he described how it was interesting that um the acl in the humans is i suppose it's quite modest for the size of the joint. And he said there's other animals uh, out there that have better kind of ACLs. Like I think he gave the example of a mountain tiger or something. And that like for sport, the actual ACL is probably not, well, it wasn't designed for some of the sports that we're doing now. I don't know if you, yeah. either of you heard that before or. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. It's definitely... I mean, I, I hadn't heard that in comparison to the animals and things like that, but it would, it would make sense, I suppose, if you're, you're talking about um, hopping off mountains in comparison yeah. to the okay. yeah. But um, <laughs> just back to you again, Sarah, um, you know, you, you, you explained what happened in 2016 and um, you went to Santry and, you know, obviously the decision then was taken to do the surgery and how long did you have to wait for the surgery and Talk us through the rehab then afterwards and yeah so I like I said it was a different kind of circumstance this time around I was fairly the minute I did, it happened I was okay we're getting the MRI because you can't do anything before you get the MRI whereas the last time I was very much no it's fine don't worry but uh so yeah I got the MRI fairly quickly um and was up in Santry within I'd say a week or 10 days 
um of that and then I had my surgery so I got I did my knee on the 10th of January and I got my surgery on the 14th of February so the reason behind that was um my knee was so um ruptured and damaged and swollen that they actually couldn't go and operate at it the way it was because there was so much trauma um in it so they actually gave me a few weeks there to do a bit of prehab they call it so before the surgery because after the surgery um you you don't have the same use of your muscles so they kind of entice you to build up as much muscle as you can uh before the surgery so I was doing that from the get-go really as much as I could and then I got the operation on the 14th of February um a great Valentine's Day <laughs> and then I literally came out of that and it was head down like working straight away um you get on a good program with Santry there you have your three-month checkup six-month checkup and nine-month checkup and it's all the whole process is a return to play process so that's what their agenda is it's to get you back to where you finished off and that was my motive as well because the minute I did my I knee I remember thinking I just want to get back to where I finished and um, that's my goal now to get back to this level of fitness and um, playing at the time I was optimistic probably I wanted to play football as well as camogie made the choice now to just stick with the camogie but yeah the rehab is intense enough like I said like once the, the first 10 days your goal is to try get off the crutches and start walking and get a walk back because I think Kelly could, will come in there a lot of people if you don't get your walk back um, get your bend in your knee and, and your extension that you can actually develop the limp um and even at that then it can go into your running technique and it can actually put you at more risk of doing your knee again so the first two weeks are really important um in that i think you would agree with that kelly would you that trying yeah. to get your walk back get the range of motion back in the knee as quick as you can that's the most important thing and you can build on that after that then yeah definitely so then once i had that um the range of motion as kelly said so basically they've been able to straighten your knee and be able to bend it to a certain level of flexion um I was back in the gym um doing trying to build up strength as much as I could get my mobility back uh, working alongside Kelly alongside Paddy O'Brien um and different people and I was lucky because we didn't go into lockdown I don't think until was it the end of March or something like that so I had was it yeah so I had a few weeks in the clinic um working away with them and then like that it was probably kind of a good thing in a sense that I had the need on before because when I got the programs from the lads um I was able to put it into place with kind of nearly oh I remember doing that um three or four years ago and I got myself through a lockdown um it, it was tough at the end of it because I didn't have the resources of building strength in your quad which a lot of people can find difficulty in so when I went back to the physios the key thing was yeah you're moving well you're back running but uh building your quad strength is so difficult um so that was a big challenge for me but it was look it was grand it wasn't as tough as the first one um I had a good support system in place and um I knew kind of the do's and don'ts of what not to do and um the minute you're back running it's a, a big milestone and um then once you're back running you can we're straight line running your your changing direction you're getting to sh shooting with the girls you're getting back into running with the girls and all of a sudden you're in contact and before you know it you're back playing so there's loads of milestones there I suppose to look at it um like it, it goes so fast from getting off the crutches to building strength to running to pivoting to getting back in contact like there's loads there and it does fly um for like I I'm lucky enough like I've got back in eight or eight or nine months um so once you put the head down and do the work you can it is manageable to get back within that timeline yeah they're good there really is no um sitting around feeling sorry for yourself after the operation it's up at it straight away isn't it yeah and like there is and I know girls who have done it like there's so many of my friends that have done it and the girls that have sat around and I've learned like they have learned the hard way and passed on the information to me um in that they've got this kind of a bend in their knee they haven't got the full extension and it puts you back so much like so the minute you get the operation you just have to um put the head down and, and do the work um and like it look it, it's it's I would say there's a sense of um 
rewarding it in it like I used to love going up to my physio appointments because I was like I wonder did I reach the targets that I'm supposed to be at this week like and I don't know is that because of my competitive instincts or what but um there definitely was a, a side of me that was even when I went up to Santry on your three months you're meant to be able to jump a certain distance on one leg or you're meant to do whatever and I was really practicing I really wanted to get the high, the, the, the good scores in six months um it's really cool actually the testing that they do at six and nine months it's biomechanical um there's sports scientists up there with you and they node you up on all your joints so basically they can see you as a stick um stick person on the screens and they have the nodes so if they see you running and your knee is bending in then that's obviously highlighting to them that you're still um you're still not uh at, you're still adversely uh, affecting your knee when you're running and we need to correct that so it is really cool and i love all, i really got into all that um SE stuff and biomechanics by doing that um and then once you get up to the nine months you're literally just hoping for the physio and the surgeon to sign you off um to get back to play just on on that then as well sarah just to add on what you're saying there yeah about how it, you know it's it's straight away you get going and how it, it you do uh, enjoy the nine months that's going on like i can honestly say and even coming from sarah's perspective as well that they're nearly stronger after coming back after the nine months of an acl rehab than they were pre-injury because they've dedicated nine solid months to building up quads building up hamstrings and like sarah was saying there about going up to santry and see in a little small detail in a stick figure of how her knees could have been collapsing inwards and where she needed to build up strength in certain little areas so it's it's not the the sentence that people sometimes think it is I know initially it's devastating but I genuinely do see people coming back a lot stronger at the end of it than they were pre-injury yeah that's, that's interesting you said that because my next question was going to be that when you do your cruciate are you at a risk of doing it again and um, because it wouldn't be as strong or also in Sarah's case is there a risk of doing the opposite knee maybe overcompensating or something that's what I was going to ask you next Kelly okay um so in a lot of the papers that I've read most of them have said that there's a, between about a two and six percent chance of re rupture in the graft in the first couple of years. And obviously, that percentage gets less and less the more time that goes on. But a lot of it is down to the rehab that's done on the knee in that first year. So if the, the rehab isn't is inadequate enough, then there's a far greater chance of being able to, to re rupture that graft in the first couple of years. Um, and then if the other knee tends to go, generally it's because you probably haven't corrected the reasons why the other knee went in the first place. So maybe it's um, muscular imbalances or maybe there's a neuromuscular issue um, that you haven't corrected and that's why the other knee goes as well possibly a couple of years later um, but then like I was saying before there's those external factors as well that in like like in Sarah's case in four years down the line a second one came but again it could have been from a push in the back that she wasn't expecting or something along those lines so you are about between two and six percent um, at risk but again it is down to the the rehab that you do how dedicated you are to the rehab um, and from my reading then as well before you return to play there's six things that you really need to be at um, equivalent to the uninjured knee so they'll test you in um, isokinetic strength tests which is why Sarah also done these on a biodex machine and they'll test your uh, quads which is the muscle on the front of your leg your hamstrings which is muscle on the back of your legs and they'll test both those muscles in comparison to the unaffected leg so you need to be able to pass them um, within a certain percentage of the unaffected leg to be able to be clear to be able to return to play then you need to be able to pass in uh, running drills and in hopping drills as well so when you pass six particular tests then you're allowed to return to play and you know that your rehab has been adequate you also need to look at your hamstring to quad strength ratio. That's a big factor as well in if you're going to re-rupture 
uh, a graft. So it's just making sure that the hamstrings and the quads are as strong as they possibly can be is, is the main thing. So a lot of it boils down to inadequate rehab at the end of the day, that if you do re-rupture it within a short space of time. Okay. And you mentioned graft there, and I suppose this is another thing I only learned today. So they actually take a graft from a tendon. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can head away there, Sarah, and say, say where yours came from first. <laughs> um, yeah. So when, I think Ray Moore, and like that, there's two that you could get. You get the hamstring, get, take a graft from your hamstring or from your patella tendon, which is on the front of your knee. And uh, I know a few of my friends like have got hamstring grafts. Um, when I was going to Ray, um, he was with the he he does patella. I'm pretty sure that's what he kind of sticks with, unless yeah, you're different. Yeah, generally, yeah, like, unless like you're not fully grown or stuff like that, would be uh, he'd go hamstring then. But yeah, I got my patella, and it was it's quite. I think that's nearly the sorest bit about the surgery afterwards, because that's where the biggest incision um is coming from. Um, and then they obviously have to sew your tendon back together then as well, or whatever. I don't really know the ins and outs <laughs> that really might, but that definitely the front of your knee there where your patella is, uh, even to this day on my left or my right knee. And um, if I was doing any exercises that required me uh, on my knee or anything like that, there would be a little bit of tenderness there and stuff. But just because that's where the graft came from um, and that's nothing to do with my ACL, that's just where the actual patella tendon is so yeah that's where I got my two anyway yeah, yeah that's Surely something I never knew I suppose I never had to think about it but I was just like that's mad so to take yeah. a bit of the tendon out of your your knee your, it's your patella knee, tendon yeah. and it put it your knee. Like what you'll find is in most of them they'll start with the patella tendon and then if you end up a re-rupture in the graft in the same knee they'll then take it out of the hamstring tendon because I think I think you can get like say some of my friends now that have got hamstrings. I think the reason why I think Ray said he'd go with patella is you can end up having hamstring issues then um, mm -hmm. if you take it from your hamstring because you could end up not doing your ACL, but you could have serious hamstring issues for the rest of your playing career. So yeah. that's why they opt with the patella, I think, Kelly, is it? Yeah. Yeah, no, the hamstring is only looked at if it's uh, you know, uh, a second a re-rupture you know and they're already after taken from the patella tendon i think one of my friends got his graft uh, he did that about three times from his medial would you ever heard of that I don't know. his medial hamstring tendon i don't know i don't i thought it could have been his medial ligament i'm not sure but i thought that oh was, you know that i don't know yeah it's be all over the place yeah um <laughs> And Kelly, could it be, is it, is there's no hereditary uh, connection then, you know, the way you hear of people have bad knees, their father had a bad knee and their brother had a bad knee and now they have a bad knee. Or... Yeah, not really for the ACLs. Um, oh, it's going into big gene pool talk then as well about different types of genes and uh, oh, it's, a, it's a really in-depth, scientific chat and it's words that I wouldn't even know today yeah. but um it's it's it has been thrown about but for the likes of ACLs not really too much of a hereditary issue definitely you would hear it for arthritis um for what other other knee issues would you get yeah kind of rheumatoid that type of stuff that you'd have hereditary issues to it but in terms of ACL it wouldn't be as much of a factor okay and Sarah, would you have been worried, I suppose, after 2016, you got back playing and all that, would you have been worried about the knee that you had done or, or doing the other one or had you worries of, you know, doing your cruciate again? Or? Um, when I went back to play fully competitively um, in my first time round, no, I didn't, to be honest with you. The first few months there when you're kind of back with the group when you can go back to contact training at like seven months or so that's probably where you'd be the most um i suppose uneasy about going back and it's not even you that are uneasy it's the players that are around you as well nobody wants to come near you when you go back training after you do your acl because nobody wants to be the person that hits their shoulder or something, something <laughs> again but um yeah no i i actually really struggled i must say first time around no second time around yeah i did struggle 
um big time mentally uh I was doing everything like correctly I was hitting all my targets um my stats that needed to be done I was working alongside Kelly inside with the tip camp um I came on actually um before we got to tip I came on in our club county final a bit prematurely uh, seven months after missing a lot of rehab with uh, lockdown and stuff so I think adrenaline kind of kicked in that day I uh, came out alive anyway and I just kind of thought when I went back with tip then that everything would just align and I'd be back playing and that would be that but I went back and I was actually terrified um I just I didn't like I was doing everything with Kelly like all these different tests like Kelly was saying there she was hitting me shoulders I was falling on the deck like everything was going like I was doing everything I should be but the minute it came to 15 I'm 15 and I was standing in the corner I was standing in the corner like I wasn't moving and um I kind of just had a, there was a, I, I think Kelly will say as well like there was probably a lack of resources inside where I couldn't be with Kelly as much as I wanted her aunt like that or she couldn't be with me as much as she wanted to because she's a physio for the rest of the team as well so I actually took time out and I went and worked with um Carbro Quillon he's a Tipperary hurler strength and conditioning coach and I was out on the pitch with him about twice a week when the girls were playing matches like uh their championship games I'd go out on a Sunday morning and hurl with Carbra um in Bursley and he would be hitting these shoulders and th- like that I've never got hit before and I was trying to get the ball off him tackling with him and the kind of mindset was then if I can actually do that with him I should be able to go back in with the girls and that's actually exactly what happened in the space of two weeks of not being near contention of being on a panel nearly um I went to being in contention to starting for the quarter the All-Ireland quarter final and then getting to start for the All Ireland semi final. So there was just, there was nothing physically wrong there at all where I had that shift of mindset. It was just completely in my head. I didn't realize it up until it, it hit me in the face when I was literally static in a corner um, of a hurling field and not Julianne Burke. Yeah, you get this one off you go. I, I'm happy enough here. So it definitely was a, um, a big mindset shift and confidence shift. Um, and then once you get back into the swing of it, uh, you're kind of asking yourself which knee is it and that's the stage I'm at now I'm obviously very mindful of the fact that I have two ACLs done and I do a good bit of um, in, integrating into my gym program a lot of rehab and stuff and once I integrate that into my program I don't really think about it anymore and that's where I kind of am now it's in my gym program I do what I need to do and that's it I know I'm looking after myself to the best I can um, do my little bit of work before trainings before games and yeah just happy out now like kind of do obviously think about it to a certain extent but the minute you cross the white lines just park it up and look whatever happens whatever happens like that's you have to live with these decisions if it goes again it goes again like whatever you just have to get on with it <laughs> and how did it come about working with Cabra that sounds like I, um, I was actually with um his partner up in the clinic in O'Brien's clinic, Paddy O'Brien. And I kind I sat down actually with Paddy for a physio session um for 30 or 40 minutes, whatever they are, and all we did was talk. And I nearly I was on the point of tears, like I just didn't know what was going on. I was doing everything that he was telling me, and we just talked for about 40 minutes. And he was like, Sarah, like you're in perfect condition, like your body is your knee is ready to go. So there's something that needs to be done here. So P- K- K- Paddy actually was the Tipperary Hurlers um, physio as well, uh, set that up there with Carbra because one of my club mates, uh, Connor Hammersey, had did his ACL the year before me again. And he had told me that he had done a good bit of work with Carbra. Um, so yeah, Carbra's like, he's just incredible. Like he's at the top of his game and what he does. And mm-hmm. I had so much confidence in what he was doing and he didn't even feel it. He like he was like yeah you're well into this out you go like you know so that's how that came about yeah and I'm very thankful for it. Very good. And Kelly, I suppose with your work, um, you know your day to day job and also with your work with the Tipperary Senior Camogie Team, and um, would you see would you see a lot of clients that have injured the ACL and what would your role be? Oh God, you you would. Unfortunately, I I rarely have a season with a team that I don't see at least one ACL. Um, and so I have seen a, a good few going through 
Um, and the best thing about being on the sideline and then seeing them in the clinic then afterwards is you're having that, you're constantly seeing them from start to finish. It's absolutely brilliant because an ACL really has to be diagnosed relatively quickly. Um, because sometimes what can happen is within about 24 hours, you can get a massive amount of swelling around the knee and then it becomes very difficult then to be able to fully test if you do have an ACL rupture. So ideally, you'd want to be on the sideline with the team and they're going to come in and see you in the clinic then afterwards so that you see straight away when they go down and you can test for your ACL ruptures and you can see if the, if the ACL is gone or not. Um, so... The, the therapist beyond that is very important and now no more important than the amount of work that the, the athlete themselves is willing to put in um but for the the rehab is most most important especially if a person wants to get back to playing sport and not re-injure themselves um so the, the role that therapist plays is just to make 100 percent sure that they're given the best quality exercises to the the athletes when they're coming in and um, making sure that they are pushing them then at the same time and um, that they're not sitting back just giving them loads of strength work that there is loads of um neuromuscular stuff um proprioceptive stuff there's the sport specific stuff coming on you're you're trying to factor in those external factors like somebody coming in from behind them and, and pushing them in the back so like all that type of stuff that all has to be included in their um rehab so it's just making sure that you try to get as many elements into their rehab in that nine month period or whatever amount of time it might take before they go back to play um just make sure you get as many elements into it as they possibly can so that they're as prepared as they can be to start back playing um, so the, the role is important, but it's also equally important that the, the person that you're giving the exercises to is, is putting the work in and, and completing the, the exercises the way they should be. And Sarah, there, you're in good company um, when it comes to doing your crucial ligament, you know, likes of Henry Shefflin, Roy Keane, Tom Brady, other Camogie players like Tyra Kenny and Galway, Kelly and Doyle, um, and Key Kenny. Um, I suppose. Kelly, I was just thinking, it seems to be all sports people who do their cruciate, or can anyone do their cruciate? I mean, if I run down the stairs in the morning and miss the last step, could I fall awkwardly and tear my cruciate? But then would I need surgery when I'm not playing sport? Or? Yeah, I suppose purely from the fact that camogie, hurl and football are the three main sports in Ireland and their main um, skills needed are to be able to change direction quickly and to be able to come from jumping up high and landing on single legs like they're some of the main skills that you need in the three main sports in Ireland so I suppose that's probably why you see it mostly in sports people but it's definitely possible for any normal non-sport playing person to do it so you could be out running after your kids and they could do a runner from left to right and you have to change direction really quickly and you could do the very same thing you can plant your foot turn your knee so your knee is kind of having is, is falling inwards a little bit. and again I think I put a, a picture up uh, that kind of mechanism of injury of how it works but it's how you plant your knee your upper body will generally tend to move and your knee will go but your foot stays where it is um, so anybody is, is, is likely to do that. It could be, um, yeah, running after your kids. You could be jumping on a trampoline and you could come down on one single leg on a trampoline and your knee could fall in and like that, the ACL could go again. You could be a farmer jumping off a, a hay bale. Like there's loads of different reasons um, that you could do it. Um, but it's very possible to go the non-surgical route with an ACL injury um, especially if you're not a sports person and you don't need to do those cutting pivoting change of direction um, type um, movements uh, so it is possible to just be able to strengthen around the knee and like Sarah was saying before the most important thing is to have really good quad strength hamstring strength and if you're able to get around the muscles around the knee as strong as you possibly can and you can still bring in you know your your, your proprioceptive skills so proprioception is how you are able to feel your body in space so if you can 
feel your knee starting to fall in it's the ability to be able to pull yourself out of that hole before you injure yourself so if you're able to work on your skills make sure that your muscles are as strong as they possibly can be then you can absolutely get away without having any surgery it is slightly more difficult all right if you do want to go back playing sport um but i suppose if you change positions i know goalies with no acl and they're yeah. perfectly fine okay um Liz, we could talk all night about it and uh, very interesting and i think we've covered loads there so far um sarah back training tomorrow night you must be looking forward to it yeah can't wait now i must say um it's been a, a long uh, lockdown with online gyms and running sessions and stuff uh but no, I, I can't wait now to get back in with the group and get that competitive streak going again. And I think everybody, to be fair, has really bought into the program that the lads have given us for the last number of months. Um, so really looking forward to just getting back into hurling because it's been all real gym and running and a bit of hurling. So really looking forward to getting the, the hurling back in. And as you were saying there, like um, I, <laughs> I'm in good company inside uh, with people who do ACLs, but I'm also inside in good company here in the house I'm living in. And we had nearly a mini pod going in here in Turles. Uh, myself, Caught the Van, Claude Quirk and Andre Lucknan are all living together here. So we'd be out doing sessions together and stuff uh, because we can, because we live together. And that's lovely. Like, so I have had that group of people, but just really can't wait to get back in with that group and, and get the matches rolling and, Get Sundays back to what they're supposed to be matches and games and watching them on the telly or going playing I'm like so yeah can't wait it's, it's where I was togging out I can't wait to get back tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> it's where I was throwing a pair of togs on me in the morning I cannot wait and hopefully we'll have a long summer of sport um, will you, you don't have to strap your knee or would you have to do anything in particular before training that others wouldn't have to do because you've had your surgery no do you know what and I like back like say from 2016 on uh, a lot of warm-ups and stuff yeah I would have probably been a bit different than a lot of people like doing single leg um hops and just activating my hamstrings and quads and making sure that they're awake so that if I do make a turn that they're they're not my knee isn't compensating for that so but to be honest with you in the last two three years I've really noticed in um warm-ups and different things like that that trainers and um, Angelo Walsh, who's with us at the moment, like any gym program that he's given us for the group or any warm ups that we've been doing, there's a lot of single leg dominate stuff in it. And I think uh, coaches and SNC coaches in particular have really noticed that there is a high amount of females in particular that do their ACLs. So it's been to our warm ups now. So a lot of the time after the girls might do their warm up, I might jump out or do it beforehand my own single leg stuff but at the moment there's actually really no need in what we're doing because everybody's doing the same thing because it's not it's a preventative not just for people who have done it but for everybody um so yeah not not a whole pile to be honest with you journal okay interesting as well okay thanks sarah and thanks very much for coming on the podcast and best look back training tomorrow and for the year i uh, wish you all success and please god an injury free uh remain in Camogie career because I think you've had your fair share of injuries and um, to Kelly as well thanks a million for coming on and um, you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the crucial ligament injury and um, really learned a lot uh, if you enjoyed this episode of the Camogie Report podcast please give us a like and don't forget to subscribe to Tipperary Camogie new YouTube channel <laughs>